In this week's episode, I'm joined by Erica Vogel, she, her, author of Advice from Your Trans Auntie. This week, our conversation is about women leading in the NFL, voting rights never going out of style, and of course, legacy privilege getting the boot. Hey there, my name is Bernadette Smith, and I'm a keynote speaker and writer. My pronouns are she and her. Welcome to Five Things in 15 Minutes, my weekly show where I bring good vibes to DEI. That is good vibes to diversity, equity, and inclusion with a little dash of corporate social responsibility. What I found is there are lots of news stories about what's going wrong in the world and lots of negative data, but there are also a lot of things going right. That's what I like to focus on. I search for stories that we can be inspired by and learn from. My hope is to inspire you to experiment with some of these actions and policies to help you build a more inclusive world. Welcome to the show, Erica. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Bernadette. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it is great to have you on the show. Will you tell folks a little bit about your book? Yeah, so Advice from Your Trans Auntie comes out. Uh, it's officially out November 11th of this year. That will be available a little bit earlier if for those that are paying attention to Amazon or whatnot. It is essentially an advice column in a book. Based on all the questions I've been asked by trans people and allies over the years about life in the process, not so much the nuts and bolts of transition, but the, how do I go about finding a job? How do I go about coming out? That type of stuff. That sounds like a great book, Erica. So how did you get the idea? You know, tell us a little bit about sort of the journey to, to coming to put the book together. Yeah, so I've, you know, I've been through a lot in my life. I'm an, I'm an older gal. Um, I've been through a lot of different experiences. Um, have known that I was trans since I was five, but never felt really safe enough or secure enough in life to take that final step of transition. And throughout my life, people have always sort of asked me for advice, just kind of because of how I go through the world. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, three years ago, I came out uh, at my previous employer, Capital One. And as I found myself being recognized all over campus, the largest campus for the company is in Washington, D.C., I had people come up and asking me tons of questions about, mm. just like I said, like, um, how do I go about looking for a job as an out trans person? Like, what do I, what do I say? How do I handle that? And over, you know, my two years there, I answered hundreds of questions, whether it was when I was leading one of the ERGs, whether I was at a conference, just in the hallways, in the bathroom. And um, I wound up having lunch with one of my, my friends, Shika, who uh, had just come back from spending three months in India with her family. And I was, I was telling her, I'm, I really want to write a book, but I don't really want to do another memoir. And she said, Erica, you're so good at answering people's questions. Just answer their questions in a book. And uh, that's really where the book comes from. I went home from lunch that day and started writing out, okay, here's all the common questions. So there's like 47, 48 questions I get regularly about wow. being trans that are in this book. And it's it's like it's very much an advice column. It's a, here's a question. Here's your answer in 500 to a thousand words. Wow. I love that format. Can you tell me sort of like, what's the most frequently asked question you get like one or two? Mm, I think, um, the one that I, the flavor that I get the most is, am I okay as a trans mm. person? Right. And let me relay how this comes across. Most of the time it's am I enough like the other trans people to be accepted? Hmm. Or I feel kind of different. And does that mean I'm not a good trans person? Right? You know, because here we are where we're going through the world, we're getting used to our fully authentic selves, we're wanting acceptance. And even within our own community, we feel like sometimes we don't fit in. And, right. and people have a lot of doubts. Like those, that first year is a really difficult process of being out there as yourself. And that question really drives a lot of anxiety for people. So I try to speak very gently, very lovingly to the idea of who you are is enough. You don't mm. need that validation from outside people to be your full self. That's probably the most often question I get. 
So that that makes a lot of sense because I think that when our identities shift or when we embrace our identity, there's just so many other things that feel like they're being shaken up yeah. as well, right? Like it's yeah. it's revolutionary in a way, or like personally revolutionary. Um, would you Very mind – like is your book more for trans folks themselves or are there questions in there for allies as well? Yeah. There are, it's, it's really for everybody. If mm-hmm. you are trans or non-binary or you have someone in your life, whether family, friend, neighborhood, uh, at your child's school or in your job, there, there is information in there. It really speaks to our life in the process. But I do speak of it quite directly to, to allies in there, like what it looks like to be one of several levels of ally, what it looks like to be, you know, Bernadette, for you to be my ally specifically. Mm-hmm. What do I need from you in my allyship, Right. Helping allies understand that there are questions you can ask and questions you shouldn't ask. What right. is it? What happens when someone says something quite negative about me and I'm not in the room, but you are? How do you handle that? So you're going to find information covering a lot of territory for anybody that's either trans or has a trans person in their life in some way. I love that. All right. Well, the book comes out uh, in about a month or so on no- November 11th, yeah. you said. So folks, yeah. make sure you check out the book. Um, You know, in this week's episode of Five Things, I wrote a little bit about Hurricane Helene and the horrible destruction and loss we've seen here in North Carolina, USA. And when I've been reading my social media posts from friends who are experiencing loss and uh, have experienced damage, sort of the common theme I, I keep seeing is people are coming together in service to others you know, good people just showing up compassionately to help. And back in the day, many years ago, I was an AmeriCorps um, member. I was, I'm an AmeriCorps alum. It's like the Domestic Peace Corps. And at one point during my service, we assisted the National Guard in building sandbags and rescuing people and pets from flooded homes. And one of the, the most moving things from my year of AmeriCorps was not just that experience, but sort of seeing in general the beautiful diversity of people coming together as a team toward a common goal. And and when you're filling up sandbags, conversations make the task, the time pass more quickly, right? Service brings people together. Compassion and curiosity Mm -hmm. are, are antidotes to assumptions and misunderstandings. And I believe that it's hard to dislike people that we're grateful for. So I'm wondering, did you experience anything like that from folks when you were coming out? Yeah. Um, well, first and foremost, I just want to say, like, watching what the aftermath of Helene has been um, devastating, but also heartwarming in the way that people have come together. My, my brother and sister-in-law live in Asheville, right? They were fortunate in that their house was undamaged, but I have other friends who are, I lived in that area for 20 years. And the stories that I hear of people coming together and looking out for their neighbors are truly what I think we all think it should be about to live in this country, right? Yeah. But back to your question. Um, when I came out, I, and a lot of trans people go through this, we're very, we have a lot of trepidation about stepping out there as our full selves, right? Because how yeah. are we going to be accepted? Are people going to look at us where we don't pass as female or male, depending on you know, which way you're going? And it is in those little kindnesses of complimenting my shoes or going into the bathroom with me to make me feel like I belong or inviting, you know, as a trans woman, inviting me into the circle of women in the workplace that had the biggest impact on my ability to feel accepted and that this is something I could continue to do. You have to remember that people don't transition on a whim. It is usually... They've tried everything else in their lives to not do this. Right. There is no option left. So they come at this with their heart in their hands, sort of like a Hail Mary, if you will. And so yeah. we show those little kindnesses. It means, makes the world of difference. Use those names. Use those pronouns. Include us in your groups. The biggest measure of success for trans people is in the acceptance of those around us. When that happens, we thrive. When it doesn't happen, we struggle to survive. I love that. Well, thank you for sharing so much of your story with us, Erica. 
Well, let's move into this week's good vibes. The first story this week comes from Levi's, which continues a legacy of supporting voter turnout with their community college commitment campaign, aiming to register 500,000 new college age voters by 2028. So they're partnering with brands like Lyft and Spotify, targeting underrepresented community college students where voter turnout lags nearly 10% points behind four-year university peers. But what I like the most is that Levi encourages its workers to participate in civic activities like voting or becoming poll workers, giving them a sense of purpose beyond work. Good vibes, Levi. I, I love this story. It's, it's reminiscent to me, um, having been at the right age for MTV's Rock the Vote, thing yeah. that happened in the, I think, late 80s, early 90s, and feeling empowered. Now, I grew up in a family that was very conscious about their community. I grew up knowing that I had better be voting by the time I turned 18. And, <laughs> um, but seeing the impact that something like that had on my friends who didn't grow up with that. And, and now, you know, and Levi has such a long history of corporate social good, right? Mm-hmm. Imagine your employer empowering you to not only vote, but be a beneficial member of your community, not just show up and get your work. So we'll pay you. I mean, that's to me, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's something that I'd love to see happen. And particularly with this younger generation, community college people tend to stay in their communities, mm-hmm. right? So we're, what we're actually empowering is local elections, which is where the real work happens. Exactly. I agree. I agree. Well, the second story this week comes from the NFL, the National Football League here in the U.S., where the Carolina Panthers recently beat the Las Vegas Raiders, but it marked a historic milestone, the first ever NFL game between two teams led by women presidents, Christy Coleman and Sandra Douglas Morgan. Big, big step for gender representation in sports leadership, especially in such a male-dominated field. Yeah. I love seeing this story as an Atlanta gal. I am a Falcons fan and not a Carolina Panthers fan, but that's okay. But I did live in the Charlotte area for a long time, so I got over a lot of that. But to see two women be presidents of an NFL team when when we still don't have great representation of many marginalized communities there is truly empowering. We have, we have a woman who's the first assistant coach, uh, the running back, a running back coach. We have referees. We have, we still don't have enough representation in black Mm -hmm. coaches and LGBT coaches at that level. So any marginalized group that makes a step forward is huge in that, but particularly in such a male dominated sport. I love seeing two women being presidents. It's amazing. It really is. Well, a uh, third story this week comes from the state of California, which just made a huge move by banning legacy admissions at private universities like Stanford and USC. So this law tackles longstanding inequality in college admissions where children of alumni or donors get favorable admission preferences. And this matters because several major colleges have actually seen a decrease in the enrollment of Black and Hispanic students in the wake of the Supreme Court ruling overturning affirmative action. So this is a pretty significant uh, law here. I was uh, really excited to see the law coming out. I was unaware of it until you you brought it up to me a couple of days ago. Um, The fact that we have... Major private universities in California, I think Stanford was one of the ones that was called out, getting Mm -hmm. rid of um, the legacy process, meaning that merit drives the admission process, not how much family, how how well known a family member is or how much money they donate to the university is, is I think, a huge win for opening the doors for elite universities to all people. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it just um, when when we see sort of retraction of diversity, we need to sort of counterbalance that, right? And so I think this Mm -hmm. this law counterbalances it in a really significant way. Okay, the fourth story this week comes from Bank of America, which has increased its pay for hourly workers to $24 an hour, part of their plan to get to 25 by next year. So this affects thousands of employees, particularly bank tellers and call center staff who may 
particularly be black indigenous people of color. So disproportionately represented in these lower wage jobs. Now, this move is very uh, significantly above the national median of $18.10 an hour for tellers. So pretty big move here for BOA. Yeah, I um, I really loved hearing this news because as someone who's been in the banking industry for 10 years, 10 years running, and then also when I was in university, I wasn't a teller, but I basically got all the checks from tellers and mm-hmm. s- sent them through the bank for processing. So I made the same money that they made, right? And these are our frontline employees and seeing them finally get a raise. And I think, I think um, Bank of America, they were at like, like you said, $18 in 2019. And to see them get to 24 this year and planning to get to 25 next year is, is a huge win, especially when we take into account the fact that how pay for performance works within banks, right? There's, there's your salary and then there's your, your bonus. And it really, um, the people who do the most work are the ones that don't usually get that bonus, that are really kind of, you know, those people that are working in the banks as a teller really deal with our customers. Right. And if we're not taking care of them, we're really not taking care of our customers. I completely agree. And these are folks who are often undervalued really in customer facing employees in, in every industry they're undervalued. And they're the ones that a, they're the face of the brand and, and B they are, um, they experience probably the most bad behavior from customers, right? Well, imagine you're going into a bank and one of the things I always talked about people that I think is so important about the, the banking world is few things are as stressful as dealing with financial issues, mm-hmm. your own personal yeah. financial issues. And if you go into the bank and you're, you're dealing with someone that's underpaid, overworked, like that's not going to give you the feeling that you're getting good customer service. And it really, they're the people that have to deal with the brunt of this person's feelings and they should be ta- well taken care of and exchange for that. Our tellers are some of the most important people in the bank. I completely agree. All right. The last story this week comes from the state of New Hampshire, where the Supreme Court upheld a school policy that protects transgender students' privacy, preventing staff from disclosing their gender identity without consent. So this is a pretty big deal um, and can set a national precedent for similar policies in other states. This is a huge deal. And I know that as a parent, and there are other parents out there that will probably be quite alarmed at the idea of their children mm, coming out as trans or non-binary in the school and then then not knowing that, right? But I think at the end of the day, most kids feel more safe at school than home in particular, Mm -hmm. right? Many of them, they get most of their meals there that that day. That's where their friends are. That might be where accepting counselor or or, uh, teacher is where they can feel the safest. And trans people deserve the right to own our narrative. And for someone to, when someone outs you, it feels terrible and disheartening. And I would ask those parents that are worried about not knowing, well, what would be going on between you and your child that they wouldn't feel safe enough to tell you who they are? Yeah. Right? Why does their gender, regardless of what it is, feel like something they can't trust you with? That's the question we should be asking. Not, why does a teacher know and I don't know? If your kid hasn't told you, there's a reason. Yeah. Oh, I agree. That's so well said. All right, Erica, it has been a delight having you on the show. Before you go, can you share with our audience a good vibe to go, our new segment, Good Vibes to Go? We'll stay on theme here, right, trans people? So um, generally, I find trans people to be quite lovely, quite open, quite inviting. All we want is a little acceptance in our lives from the people around us. So uh, as we called out earlier, offer those little kindnesses, go to the bathroom with trans people, talk to them, honor their names and pronouns, because again, that acceptance drives so much success for us. And then a final tip that I'll ask, because we do get invasive questions. If you would be uncomfortable with someone asking you an invasive question about your body, should you ask me an invasive question about my body? All right. Good advice from Erica. My good vibe to go is to learn about the Jewish holidays. There was one that was just last week. Rosh Hashanah was last week. Yeah. Bunch of others coming up. You can learn the dates and some tips for your team from a LinkedIn post by Nate Shelev. So I'll make sure that gets put in the show notes as well. 
Erica, how can folks keep in touch with you? Oh, um, it's really easy. You, If you just go to my website, ericavogel.com, first and last name, uh, you will find... Uh, you can hit me there in terms of contacts, but all of my socials are there. So instead of trying to tell you Instagram and threads and LinkedIn, that's probably the best place to go to find me. You can even get to my sub stack from there. Awesome. Erica, it has been awesome having you on the show. And folks, if you don't already get the Five Things newsletter, you can subscribe at fivethingsdei.com. Have a great week. Thank you for listening to Five Things in 15 Minutes. I hope you found yourself inspired by at least one of this week's stories. If you did, would you mind sharing it with a colleague and leaving us a review on your favorite podcasting platform? And if you don't already get my Five Things newsletter, join at fivethingsdei.com. I'm Bernadette Smith, and I'll see you next week right here for Five Things in 15 Minutes, bringing good vibes to DEI. DEI.